We're going to look at something today, a little bit of history, a little bit about machining and manufacturing in the U.S. What we have here is a H. Gerstner and Son uh, machinist tool chest or toolbox. This is actually a wooden box, an older box. I think the man who originally owned this purchased it new back in the 1950s. Being a machinist, and back in the days when you had to have your own tools and toolbox, you know, you kind of separated yourself as a status symbol by having the highest quality and most expensive tools, which, you know, with hand tools would be steric. And uh, as far as toolboxes, like today, the Kennedy toolbox, the metal one, is standard. But in the old days, the guys used to have these Gerstner toolboxes because they were extremely expensive. Uh, if you go to their website now, this company is still in business. This particular model with the, uh, I call it leatherette covering, it's not vinyl, um, is no longer made. But they have another box slightly larger than this and made out of wood and they go for the lowest priced item on their website is $1,200. Okay. I remember these. I don't know what they retail for, but you know, you're probably looking in the old days. I know used, they used to go for 300 bucks, And that was 25 years ago. Now this one here, I've seen several of these over the years. <clears throat> like I said, it was a status symbol. And what you did is once you got working, You'd wait for a guy to retire, and when he retired, usually he sold his tools, and you'd try to get your hands on a wooden toolbox. That kind of showed you had status. Now this one here is in fairly good shape all the way around. I've seen this model before, okay? I don't know if this model is uh, like on the low end with this covering, and I have seen them which were the exposed wood. Um, and that was, it was like a big deal to have one of these. <clears throat> so we'll open it up. You gotta remember back in the time when quality and everything took, uh, meant something. You know, it was something to have one of these. And it has its signature mirror up on the top lid. All the Gerstner toolboxes have this and have. And you got your drawers for your tools. I mean, this one here is in pristine condition. I've never seen a wooden toolbox in this nice of shape. Uh, it's pretty wild. Now, like I said, nowadays machinists don't have to have their own tools. The last few jobs I had, <clears throat> I didn't have to bring my toolbox in. At one time, all your micrometers, calipers, all your uh, small tools, hand tools, you had to provide. You had to have them. Um, and you had to have a toolbox. And like I said, the standards Kennedy, my Kennedy 25 years ago cost $130. I, and it's the same size as this, basically the same layout, too, with drawers. But metal. Now, why they covered this with this uh, coating over the wood, I don't know. But as you see, the finish here, and it's got the label with the model number. Uh, the other ones, this wood, exposed wood finish would be around. I've seen them like that also. And like I said, I think this is the small size, and you'd get bigger. And, of course, bigger means more money. But it's pretty interesting... Uh, thing <clears throat> like I said at one time you used to have like a Gerstner toolbox and all steric tools because steric not only made uh, like micrometers calipers steric also made punches scales uh, everything so if you were trying to tell everybody at work that you were not a BS artist you had the wooden toolbox full of steric tools you know which nowadays who knows but it's pretty neat. We'll take a little closer look at this. 
And then we'll kind of look at some of the tools that were in here. You know, some people say, hey, it's, it's just a toolbox. But back when quality and people took pride in what they did, this is what you ended up with. And basically it's a standard machinist toolbox with the drawers and that in there. Uh, felt, got the little green felt on there. But like the guy said, you know, for the age of this, none of the drawers stick. They all work smoothly. And as you can see from the lines, you know, this ain't one of them Chinese boxes. This thing is perfect all the way around, even after all these years. You know, you had your signature mirror in the top lid. And you go down here, and you had your label with the model number on it. Pretty neat. Let's see if I can get my hand to stop shaking. And still works smoothly. <clears throat> it's a beautiful box, but then again, you know, the value, at one time guys would go nuts trying to buy one of these. Now I don't, I don't even know what you can get anything out of it. I see a bunch of them on eBay in different conditions, but uh, this is the nicest one I've, I've seen in the 35 years I've been a machinist. I've never seen one in such nice condition. I mean, other than a little discoloration on the top and the backs, usually when you slide them up on the benches, and the back's got a little mark on there. But usually this gets torn and comes up and then the handle's worn, you know, very nice. Yep, Gerstner toolboxes. Most people don't even know what, what they are anymore or what they meant. So let's take a look at some of the old tools he had in here and we'll kind of explain what they are. First thing I found was several <coughs> steel rules or scales as they're called. And these are all just standard. Now this one's got a little dent in it. Not that high quality. But these were precision uh, tools. And at one time, let's see what this one is. Uh, I don't know what the name is. This is Steric. It may be starts, and you see he's got little short, short scales, and even a shorter one to measure. These were actually used to take measurements. You always kept this in your shirt pocket. Now, another interesting old tool that I found in there were calipers. Got one small internal, a large internal and this is for measuring diameters. Now back in the 20s or 30s it's kind of like getting in you'll see something like this with woodworking but what you used to do is these were and I learned in uh, Navy school they had a test where we take this something like this and measure they had a step shaft with five diameters and you'd have to measure on the shaft. Take a measurement with this and how it works is you adjust this until it goes along the diameter. Yeah, let me try to get it. You open it up. And then you get it, then you adjust it while this is in the lathe until it just barely touches the diameter. Then you would take this and on a scale, the 64ths graduation, if you look, you find a side that has 64ths. They said that on a precision, precision scale, a 64th uh, marking was exactly 5 thousandths in width. So you would take this here, put it against the scale, and then read uh, your measurement 
and you were supposed to be able to measure something within five thousandths of one of these old calipers. Um, that's the way they did it back in the old days, or get a rough measurement. If you're roughing something down, these kind of come in handy, like you, you stop the lathe, touch it off, and take a quick measurement of what, what you got. And these ones here, it's a little tiny one, there's a bigger one. These are the same thing, same principle, but they work internally. Man, hand shaking today. You screw that down and you go into a bore, you know, take it, and then you go up against the scale and measure it. Uh, you don't really see these anymore, at least not in metal working or lathe work, but in a lot of old toolboxes, and I got a box with a whole bunch of these in there. Uh, maybe we'll, if you're more interested in it, we'll cover this at another time, but that's what he used. This is all a, a way of making precision measurements, the scales and those calipers. So that's a blast from the past, something you really don't see used anymore. Like I said, the woodworkers on a wood lathe will use something similar to this. Then we had this device here. Now this is a handy device. Uh, what this does, you look. Well, it's locked. It might be locked up. Ah, I'm gonna have to work on that one. But what this does, it has one tip and like a scribe here. And what you do is you put daikon on a uh, round piece, bluing, and you spin it in the lathe. Put this up against the face, and then let that scribe hit your bluing, and it would scribe a line on a cylindrical piece in a lathe. So when you were turning depth-wise, you'd know where to stop. You had a visual marker. This is an interesting tool. I've used these uh, when I brand an engine lathe, and once I get my lathe, I'll use it again. I have another one, and now I have this one. Then another tool, which this here is not, it's a divider. Just got points on it, and they're covered up, so you want to keep them sharp. Because what you would do with this is just like a drafting tool. You would take a uh, metal plate, put layout fluid, prick punch a hole in the center, you would put one thing in there, and then you would scribe on the bluing a circle. And then you could lay out a bolt hole pattern or, or whatever. So these are where your layout, and uh, this is a layout tool for your layout work when you used to do it. And another interesting little thing is a surface gauge, is what this is called. And what this is, is a precision machine base. And if you notice, there's like this little scribe thing here. And what you would do is you would go on a granite table, something that's dead flat, and you would set this scribe with a block or something for a height, and then you could take your scribe, place something up against their angle plate or something, and then you would also just, you just go and scribe a line across. That's one way of using this. What I've used these for is we've set these with like a little test indicator, and you take a part and you could check your squareness in that by sliding an indicator across using this little uh, device here. In the old days they used them a lot. You don't see these anymore. I worked in one factory where they actually used these. Uh, again, this is a layout tool or they turned them into inspection tools. And then of course he had the scribe. Now the scribes used when you put the bluing on material to lay out your holes or whatever or make measurements using the scale. And again, this is tools for layout work. Okay, this little depth uh, scale. I think it has angles on the back. You usually see these. These come in handy when you're doing a quick check or say you... Uh, or boring something out and you want to know how far you go, a lot of people set things on a tailstock. You could just go by eye and set this 
and it get you close when roughing out or take measurements. It's another interesting little tool. He also had a Morse taper drift. Now this is to get your Morse taper out of uh, either different spacer sleeves or something. You'll see uh, when you take it out, you got a slot in there, and that's, that's to knock your Morse taper drift. It's another handy tool. He had a couple small precision C clamps. These are always helpful uh, when you're clamping stuff up in the middle or something. Or uh, usually, what we used to do is you mount an angle plate, then clamp a part to the angle plate with this, and then machine it on a mill setup. So that's always a handy item. And of course, all your different reference charts, always handy to have one of them, give you all your drill sizes and diameters. Also tells you on these here uh, for your tap, your tap size, the drill size for your drill taps and that. So these are always handy to have around. They usually hand them out to you. you had feeler gauges and Craftsman drill. Uh, that's to tell your drill size. You just so if your drill has been has the uh, size scratched off, it's a way to quickly check the diameter of your drill size. Uh, neat little thing to have. And I think the way it was, somebody went through this toolbox. But the one, the real good find was I found a uh, Lufkin. Catalog number eight, the uh, price list from March 30th, 1959, and all of it's in pristine condition. Pretty wild stuff, you know. And the only precision tool he had, which was very interesting, was a set of Lufkin micrometers, zero to ones. In the original box, mint condition. I mean, nice item. Now, what these retailed for, I think, back in the 50s was like 25 bucks, which was a small fortune in 1959. These things would go, when I started out, a good set of mics, zero to ones by Sterrett and that, were, they were 80 to to $100. It was close. And that's in 1980s money. Okay, now I think they're $150 or something for a real nice brand name quality. So I went on eBay and looked these up figuring, hey, you know, I was thinking they're maybe worth $50. Which probably with the box and everything and all the original stuff probably is. But you probably won't find nobody buying them because I found these same exact micrometers used from $10 to $20. You know, they're, they're not as nice as this. This is like, these are like brand new. But you can't get a lot of money for them. And like I said, the demand isn't there. People are not required to have their own tools anymore. It used to be like a set of zero to one mics. You can sell that in 10 minutes. You just walk in the shop and go, hey man, I got a set of mics to sell. And uh, somebody buy them. Somebody always needed a new set of mics or was starting a job, needed tools. There was always someone there. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this neat old stuff, I mean, and these, I don't care what you say, these are better than anything made in China, period. Lufkin, Sterrett's, anything. You know, Brown and Sharp, these are quality tools. Last man, last a man a lifetime if he didn't abuse them. But now our market's flooded with all these cheap tools and these neat old tools and that. Really, if you wanted nice older tools, you can go online and get them for practically nothing, you know. Oh, well, well, that's my thing on the toolbox and a little trip down memory lane looking at all these old things. I remember these. You used to get them, you know, and you'd look through what you needed and try to figure out how much you're going to take out of your paycheck when they order them for you through the company. And, you know, you got all your tools and that. The bygone era, you know. Now they just tell you, 
Here, this is what you got to work with. Use this, and that's that. All right.